Do you want a sync clap? <laughs> We could no, do he doesn't a, want it. He bloody doesn't want it. Look at this <laughs> renegade. <laughs> we could do a, 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 a clink. A little clink, you know. Chris Cox. Hello. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming. It's my pleasure. And you're here in yes. London. Yeah. And story. one of the key... Well, I mean, you live here, don't yeah, you? Yeah, I do now, yeah. yeah. But one of the key things you're doing is this big other belly yes. show. Good. Are you excited? I'm very excited. Now, have um, you performed there before? Yeah, I did it last year. Um, and it's a lovely place to perform. So I'm doing two. I'm doing what am I doing? When, Tuesday the 29th of May and then Tuesday the 19th of June mm-hmm. um, at 9 o'clock each night. And it's a great... It's a really good venue to perform because it's such a great atmosphere down on the South Bank when the other belly's there. Um, and it's a lovely proper, sort of proper theatre venue. Yeah. The only problem with it is a tent. Yeah. So there's bits in this show in particular. The last show didn't have them so much, but this show's got some sort of like theatrical bits of sadness. Yeah. So I want silence. You just hear guys <laughs> up like, <going>, hey! <laughs> um, but I've been lucky in that. I realised I don't follow sport. I don't care for it. You'd never <laughs> guess it to look at me. But, um, <laughs> but uh, there's um, some football thing on. Oh, up. is there, right? Yeah, some big football. I was like, oh, God, there's going to be, like, cheering and stuff. And realised I managed to book my show in the one night there's no football. Oh, brilliant. Well done. Very Thank savvy. You. Very pleased with myself. Mm. Just luck. Luck. Well, you do find that in... Because it comes to Edinburgh every year. To yeah. Say, the cow. And it's... um, Because it's like a bar outside. Yeah, yeah. It's just the big pasture. Exactly. I suppose with the festival, it's... And with the Udder Belly Festival as yeah. well. It's some people are there for the theatre some people are there, there for just the... drinking it's good because you get like people who just go for a drink and they go I might go see a show mm-hmm. and you get drunk so you go oh, let's go see a show and they're the ones <laughs> you don't want um, but also I think what's great about it is it's quite nice particularly if you're doing a few shows is that people outside will hear bits of it mm. and go what's going on in there yeah. I should go in there let's go see that <laughs> Well, it's you kind of need all the audience you can get as well because it's four four hundred. Yeah, yeah, about four hundred, and I use four ten, I think, officially. And obviously, I, as a mind reader, need minds to read. Mm. So it needs to be uh, busy, so I can go, not just hey, you know that thing you thought of a minute ago. Think of something different. We'll do something new. <laughs> do you have a lot of drunk people turn up? Sometimes I'm quite or? lucky normally. I'm always cautious about what time my show is. So these are quite late, so nine o'clock. So I'm slightly worried, but I think it'll be all right. Is nine o'clock good then for you get more? I think nine o'clock's quite good for London. I think um, particularly because it's only an hour, so you're out there by ten. The worry is, of course, nine o'clock gives people more time to drink. Mm. So Edinburgh, for example, I'm always on slightly earlier. Yeah. Okay, and that's a conscious decision. Though. Yeah, I think um, the show, I don't say it's a family show, but it's a f- kids like magic, so I don't mind them coming along, because mm-hmm. might as well buy those tickets. <laughs> um, so it's always, a, yeah, sort of, I want it, in Edinburgh it's normally sort of around 7 o'clock-ish, mm-hmm. sort of an early evening time. So you kind of, do you aim it towards the family? Or? No, not particularly. This show kind of, I didn't aim it at all towards family, I just, this shows, uh, there's a whole narrative about love to it, mm. and I always knew what the tricks were going to be, and I always knew what the story was going to be, and when I started previewing it, and then doing it, I realised, actually, it's the most family-friendly show I've done, because there's not many swears, and it's all, <laughs> actually, there's, there's enough amazing tricks, because often I find, particularly mind-reading stuff, kids, it's not visual enough for them, yeah. but this show, there's a lot of visual element to it, and although it's, by far and away, it's a proper show for proper adults, it's nice to have families that come up and really enjoy it. Mm. So it was a conscious thing to make it a, a narrative piece mm. because because I saw it in, in Edinburgh. Oh, thank you. Now, it's much I better now remember. as well. Much oh, better it? now. I've done it a lot more since then. <laughs> have you added more to it? Or? I've just, yeah, little bits of added, little bits of change. I've just done three weeks in New Zealand where we kind of tightened bits up and mm. kind of find yourself, stuff suddenly appears to you and you go, why didn't I think of that? 70 shows ago yeah um, so it just all gets slightly better I mean can it be a thing that you beat yourself up about it because you know it's only now you yeah, realise it's only now, yeah there's a bit for the whole of Edinburgh literally it was the first tour date I did after Edinburgh I realised oh that shouldn't be the same that should be different and I changed <laughs> it and there was a bit of the trick which kind of always hit alright it was never hitting how I wanted it to hit and then I changed this thing literally it was changing one word and mm. it suddenly gets an amazing reaction. It's really weird. And I suppose you, you kind of worry you worry about that, but then you need the experience in order yeah. to... I think the, it was still good before then, but it gets better. It's like anything. The more you do it, the better you get. Yes. Yeah, so exactly. you just, yeah, you can't start to... Um, you start to... Everything starts to become second nature. 
so you kind of free up a little bit of your mind mm -hmm. to think about other things as you're doing it and you'll find ad libs that you'll then stick in the show and so this one's called, is it Chris Cox Can't Read Minds? No, this one or? is uh, Fatal Distraction. Fatal Distraction. Yeah. Although I can't That's read minds one. either. That's okay. very, always, <laughs> always still a subtext. A, still a feature. Yeah. yeah. Fatal Distraction. Yes, I'm a right. mind reader who can't read minds. Okay, and you've taken this pretty much for the whole year. Yeah. And, and been doing it. So we did Edinburgh and it was very well received, obviously. <laughs> Five star reviews and awards. Um, <laughs> but don't mention it, it's embarrassing. Uh, and then I did a UK tour and I've just done a three week tour of New Zealand and now the other belly shows. Mm -hmm. And then hopefully some more in the autumn. And it was, uh, yeah, I always wanted to do a mind reading show of a narrative because I don't think anyone's ever done it. Mm -hmm. No one's really had a proper story or done. Darren does amazing stuff, obviously, but no one's just done a spectacle. Yeah, yeah so. no one's done a proper theatre show of it with mm -hmm. incredible mind reading, but within that, an actual something to hang on to and hook. So I, I wanted to do that. I suppose it's good to kind of. I mean, I was seeing a thing by Matt King that you yeah. probably know that he doesn't want an audience to have the same opinion of him when they come in. Yes, when they go out. Otherwise, what's the point? You know, there needs to be a sort of journey. Yeah, exactly. And you've progressed, you know, somewhat. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I think you want, um, you want, a, you, obviously you want your audience to like you because the only reason you ever anyone really performs is to get love mm -hmm. and adoration and people to like them. But I kind of, I like an audience to feel surprised by it. And I think if you're going to a mind reading show, you're going to expect mind reading. Mm -hmm. So I try to surprise them along the way. Every trick has sort of little elements where you wouldn't expect it to go that way. There's a whole section where people just think of thoughts for me to do. Yeah. And I start doing them. I see. Which yeah. I love. Um, and, and particularly with the story, people, I don't think, often people will come up to me at the end and be surprised that they got as emotionally involved as they did. And sometimes people might have a little cry or something. Mm. Because it's a really nice to sort of hit that because you don't expect it yeah well it comes around the back doesn't it because it's you know you're yeah. going to see a, a mind reading show yeah and you know it's going to be funny you know it's going to be mind reading but you don't know about everything else in it exactly yes so are you do you count yourself as a mind reader is that your sort of yeah. job title my job title I say is a rather unpithy mind reader who can't read minds mm -hmm. yeah um, because I like the fact that Oh, no one can really read your mind uh -huh. if I could read your mind I wouldn't be telling you I could do it mm -hmm. I'd just be doing it um, I don't think it's important to credit your audience with enough intelligence to know that you're not really doing it and to sort of set your stall out and go here are some ways I might be doing it yeah. right okay let's get on with it and I think in the early days of me doing that I would have to sort of explain slightly more about certain psychological techniques or certain magical techniques or body language and that sort of stuff where now it's kind of particularly because it's great work Darren's done with uh, Andy Nyman is that you it's kind of said for you now people will assume it rather than mm. I was chatting to a friend a um, brilliant magician from Bristol called Peter Clifford, Clifford. Yeah. Um, and he says he goes out and does close up gigs and he's fantastic but people always used to say to him I know how it's done hands quicker than the eye and yeah. now everyone goes I know how it's done psychology <laughs> so I, go, I think the general populace the conscious thought has changed to that it's, which is, suits me perfectly because I think actually psychology is really the interesting part of mm. making it look like you can read minds so have you studied psychology at yeah all, I did um, Backwell School in Bristol I grew up there and did psychology there and mm. it was when I started doing psychology at school but I, I was always doing magic and I was doing mind reading magic but yeah. kind of doing it a bit like a um, like, oh think of something is it this mm -hmm. um, where I looked at psychology and went ah oh, that's interesting there was a um, thing I thought oh that reminds me of this trick mm. oh if I present it like this it'll look like more than a trick and yeah. then certainly um, the last few years all my shows I try to base every trick on a real bit of psychology that I've learned mm -hmm. do you worry about a dishonesty thing I, n I mean I know you're a, a, a Mind reading yes. magician, there is a, an element of that. There's an implied dishonesty there. Yeah, but if you're explicitly saying to an audience, I'm doing this, and you're not, mm. I remember Penn Gillette, you know, he yes. does the nail gun. Nail gun routine, yeah. And he changed that because he wasn't comfortable with, with saying that it was a memory thing when it's yes. not. He lets you, he, the implied thought is that it's a memory thing mm. with Penn. Um, in fact, I've had this discussion a lot with Penn, and it's a really, it's an interesting area because I. I think, I think in fact, I think it's Andy or Darren that used the phrase once that they are honest within magicians are honest within their dishonesty. Yeah. And I think that, I think within the realms of everything you do, you are setting up that you are doing a magic show and a mind reading show, and you can't really do that. And particularly, that's why I say I'm a mind reader who can't read minds. The first and last thing I say is a version of me saying I can't really do it 
no matter what you've seen, it's not real. I'll make all I can do is make you think I can. And there's the element you want to play it for entertainment, and I know certainly psychology is an interesting and entertaining way of performing. Mm-hmm. And I think there's a lot, a lot of basis within psychology behind what I do. Also, within that, there's a lot of magic as well. And it's you have to sort of weigh it up yourself of how much do you want to deceive and how much do you want to um, make people believe. And it's that sort of thing. If you don't want to ruin the enjoyment of watching a trip by overstating a uh, method, mm-hmm. and equally you don't want to ruin it by understating a method. Right, okay. And I think you sort of... The way I've worked it out is you have to come up with what you're comfortable with. And I... Like, and my aim is to let an audience believe what they want to believe. If you want to believe it's all psychology, then great. If you want to believe it's all nonsense, then also great. I will give both people enough rope to hang themselves with. Okay. And you can get out of it what you will, but I will be honest in saying it is a mixture of all the things I say it is, mm-hmm. but it is a mixture and it's not solely yeah. one thing. So, so you, wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't be comfortable if someone thought it was actual mind reading that you um, could actually do anything I think people are, it's a tough one because although I wouldn't be hugely comfortable with that I don't I think people to some extent can believe what they want to believe and I don't want to be the person that says to them uh, hey you know what you believe oh, that's nonsense mm-hmm. and I think in, in an instance of someone believing I can read their minds I would quite clearly go well you know I can't mm-hmm. and it, it depends what where that thought pattern's going to lead to someone if it's going to lead to someone paying a lot of money for a psychic which I personally believe to be a load of rubbish then I I don't want that to be the case um, I suppose the only thing you can say is I can't read minds yeah. so just be open with yeah, that that's yeah that's it I think that's why I quite early on went mind reading who can't read minds mm. you sort of set that stand and you go great I can't do it I am going to do it now but remember I can't <laughs> I think that's a uh, yeah that's a, it's, an, it's a tough one because it's like when you see Copperfield fly, you know he can't fly. Because mm, yeah. last time I checked, when he came to England, he took a plane. Yeah, so you sort exactly. of go, well, he can't really fly. But when you see someone read mind, it's a different sort of magic because there's a, question there's a doubt. Mm. He's just done that. And maybe after all these years of evolution, this is the guy. Mm. It's just close enough, yeah. isn't it? It's because close enough to react. And that's why it's exciting to perform and to watch. Mm. And you want to continue to perpetuate that but you also want to be honest with yourself and it's a uh, yeah it's a strange it's a it's a thing I think a lot about mm. and it's kind of it's a moral and ethical stance really yeah I think that's you go I remember there's um, in a similar way to Penn actually with his nail gun trip there's a thing I do in the show where I get people to hum songs as they're doing drawings yeah yes um, and I remember in the early versions of it I would say have a song so I can work out what you're drawing and then I dropped that line because I thought it was too much implication that if you have a song I know exactly from that song what you're going to draw mm. so by dropping that line because I'm also asking them lots of questions about themselves and I'm controlling them and I know certain people might draw certain things and there's all other techniques I'm using and I didn't want to set my stand and go hey that's how it's done. Yeah. And actually, in the same way, pen dropping his line, you pull that out and you go, actually, people, if they want to believe that's the method, they will go mm-hmm. with that themselves and you don't have to tell them that. But it's just putting, yeah, it's just being at a place where you're comfortable. Yeah. Yeah. I think you have to sort of morally make that decision of what are you comfortable saying and not saying. I see some uh, mind readers these days that, that do just, they don't say it's tricks and mm. I feel that, that really irks me and it upsets me because it's the same lie as saying you're a psychic. Yeah. It's the exact same lie. Whether you're saying psychic or psychologist, it's the same lie, you're lying. Mm. Um, well, it was something Andy Nyman said about, you know, once you see the effects that doing a mind reading trick does on people, yeah. you th- there's a point where it's like, I, I could use this yeah. for wrong reasons, but it's the decision not to. Not to, yeah. It's the decision to go out and use it for entertainment. Decision, and, to be honest. Yeah. yeah. And I think some people tread on that tread over that line I think and mm. you can kind of see why they might but it irks me because it's almost like there's a uh, you, sort of, you see people do shows in particularly Edinburgh now sort of, when I did my first Edinburgh show six years ago yeah. it was kind of, there was no other magician really doing Edinburgh at that time it was mm. me and then a year after Pete Furman and Barry and Stewart came up and I think Ali that year yeah Jerry's always um, up yeah Jerry of course yeah, yeah. Um, and uh 
and there's been a, as years go by more and more acts appear mm-hmm. and it's great I think for the art of magic because well it isn't it's not because the problem with magic of course is if someone sees a bad comedian they go they don't like that comedian they see a bad magician and they go All don't magic. like magic yeah so as long as the shows are good then it's great because the more you see a good show you want to see another good show mm-hmm. but see other mind readers and other acts come up in Edinburgh and look at how they're sort of marketing and selling their skills and you sort of go if I were that person I've done a bit more research as to what other acts have done already in Edinburgh and what they're saying exactly because yeah. part of me so when I see that sometimes wants to put, call out and go hey you know how you're saying you're really doing it <laughs> I say you're not <laughs> and I know yeah yeah, yeah because I know the method you're using <laughs> and I know it's not what you've just said yeah um, yeah, it's a, uh, it's a it's a line, isn't it? It is. And it's a line that you don't have in magic, and that's the. Uh, I mean, that's one of the key distinctions. Yeah, but it's, it? it's the belief, the ability for it to seem mm. real. So with your, I mean, because you do almost exclusively mentalism. Yeah, that's so it. You, well, I mean, is oh, it? there's a bit of magic in the show now as well. Oh, kind of is. Mentalism's the official term for the category of magic, mm. in the way prestidigitation is the official <laughs> term for card magic. Right. But you say you, you're doing magic in the show as yeah, well. Yeah, I'm quite honest that I use. I don't think that. Some people think, certainly some mind readers, particularly ones that take things very seriously, think mm. magic's a dirty word, and I don't think it is. Well, it's a strange one. I don't think you'd see Darren doing it. But straight card trick no. on stage but he might do a card so trick honest. and not say it's a card trick yeah which he has done yeah and he is. does it and I think he actually I think that that team have done that very well and that was kind mm. of an inspiration for me of going with the right it's got to be the right dressing the right element the right reasoning behind it and particularly in this show I've got two proper magic tricks that I've created and they right. don't feel like magic tricks and they're not magic tricks it's not sawing someone mm. in half it's not going to pick a card any card it's not what you would traditionally says a magic trick but also it's not a mind reading trick but it's within the realms of possibility of mind reading and um, weirdly one of those is is my favourite thing in the show oh right it's the and bit also, you look forward to yeah it's the yeah. bit I look forward to it's the bit audiences talk about a lot because it's just a really visual bit and often mm. mind reading is not very visual and despite me doing sections where you think of thoughts in the audience and I start doing them which is very visual this whole thing is um, I, can't, I don't, I don't want to say what it is because it's my favourite thing and it's nice <laughs> when it happens but it's a it is in essence a trick, moment. but it doesn't mm. feel like a trick. It's the stuff people go, wow, that bit. And I think in the format of a mind reading show, it's, it gives you a great opportunity to do that. I mean, yeah. I think I saw Darren do, it was a card trick. Mm. And as I've got a bit of background knowledge of magic and knowing that it's a card trick. Yeah. But because it was cards that they bought in, they were special cards, yeah. it, it just changed it. It does. And it, I think there's a lot to learn from that, from magicians almost. Yeah. That, I think how much significance you can put on something. Certainly, that sort of, sort of the ability to entertain and to, um, not to con, con the wrong word, but to put direction elsewhere, misdirection. And I think the reason mentalism and mind reading is within the realms of magic is because all of those skills are good and mm. vital. And I think to do, to perform it well, you need to have that background in magic. And I think... Darren's obviously got a brilliant background in card magic. Mm. Uh, I started doing magic, got into mind reading. I think when you know the basics of magic, it makes you better at developing your own things. Where if you, lots of, uh, sort of people these days come into mind reading, just come straight into mind reading, you go... Dive into it. Yeah, yeah. actually, <laughs> you'll be much better if you know... It's like if, you, if, you're, yeah, if you're a chef and you just dive into, I'm making bread, that's all I'm doing. You're actually probably mm. be a better bread maker if you can also make cakes and this and that. You mm. sort of, the more you know around the surrounding areas, the better you become. Yeah, it's almost like a qualification in a way that magic is the, and there's specialism. Yes. Yeah. You know, there's the close-up, there's the mentalism. Yeah, there's the illusions, there's, there's the you, work with doves, there's all that nonsense. <laughs> uh, have you worked with doves? Never. Not once. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, don't go near animals. <laughs> no animals in any show? No animals. Have I ever used... Uh, there's a bunny in this show, but not a real bunny. Oh. Uh, uh, toy bunny in a slight nod to the movie Fatal Attraction and a slight oh. nod to bunnies in hats in <laughs> magic I think animals I mean they were an interesting one uh, going back to Penn and Teller I yeah. think they're putting a cow in there they so, are putting a cow which is, dressed as an elephant which I think is just brilliant amazing <laughs> I had a um, I just remember a set with Teller in a hotel lobby in London where he was having a very serious discussion about about the cow how to train a cow <laughs> 
We're talking about um, the, the pantomime Jack and the Beans. You know, sometimes yeah. pantos have cows. It's a normally cow. someone in the suit, but sometimes it's kind of like, do people train these cows? <laughs> Where do you get these cows? <laughs> this is a brilliant desk. It's only a discussion magicians will ever have. I think that's the thing with magic. You, you know, like, go to conventions. There's sort of discussions. It's incredible. You see. It's, um, <laughs> it's, yeah, and certainly everything, everything in your back of your mind, anything you ever see, you go, is there a trick in that? Mm. Maybe that's a trick. Yeah. It's like an alternative universe. It almost. is. Yeah. You train your brain to think slightly weirdly. And, mm. um, Did you do much on the magic circuit itself? No, not at all. I very, I've always... In fact, one of my shortcomings when I first started was... Um, that I didn't know the the laws and the rules of magic. Oh, did you not? So I never, I'd never been to conventions or lectures. I literally bought tricks, books, saw mm-hmm. stuff, and started doing it. Yeah. And then the more I did it, the more I got to know some magicians. Went, oh, so this is, oh, I see. This is, you don't do this, you don't do mm. that. Um, so I've never been one to go to lectures or conventions or the magic circle. I went to my first ever convention last year. Really? Because um, a friend asked me to. Uh, they did a mentalism day. It was me and Andy Nyman and Luke Chimay and Mark Elston doing a day talking about mentalism. And they asked me to come and talk, and I thought, actually, yeah, I think I've got something I can say. So I went to that and then went to the convention, which was eye-opening and fascinating. <laughs> um, and I think partly by having avoided that, I probably am doing stuff which I wouldn't have done otherwise. Definitely. Yeah. So is it more of a comedy background that you've come from? Yeah, I think comedy and particularly for me, theatre, they're, mm. they're my background, and it was always... I always entertained and performed from. Right. Uh, I didn't. I was in a, my first ever sort of piece of proper theatre at the age of six. I was on stage in the Bristol Hippodrome mm. doing pantomimes. I was in Pickwick. So it was always. I always liked performing, and magic was always an outlet for me to perform. Yeah. And I think if I'd have been funnier or worked harder at being funnier, I'd have gone in straight down straight stand up. Have Actually, you ever tried? Or? Yeah, sort of. I do comedy club gigs with this sort of stuff, but there's always tricks in it. I started. I was 16, 17, started doing stand-up around Bristol, trying stuff at open mic nights with um, when Russell Howard was That's just sort of doing, I would be on the same bill as him as he was building up, and mm-hmm. just never felt comfortable, and felt partly because I was too young, mm. but I knew I could entertain tricks and always enjoyed, my favourite thing in the world is just that moment where you watch someone's belief system collapse away for a split second. <laughs> to have that power. Yeah. It's quite exciting. I love yeah. that, I love that. Um, yeah, it's a great... I love it as an art form. I think it's mm. it's such a entertaining thing to go and see, and it's when gaining, it's done well as well. Yeah, it's gaining popularity. Yeah, as well, very much because you were saying that Pete's up there, yeah. and Ali Cook's Ali up Kirk there, and Barry and Stewart, Barry and Stewart, would you, who are great. But I mean, mm. do you worry that it's becoming saturated? A little bit, but I think certainly Pete, Ali, Barry and Stewart, and me, which kind of I think if you look at the Edinburgh Festival and Magic and certainly like the other belly oil tours we're kind of the acts doing it mm. and we're all very different yeah. you look at us you see my show you won't see anything that Marion Stewart or Pete will do and vice versa mm. so I think that's good it shows the range of Magic in the same way you look at all the comedians out there and you see a range of comedy well I think that's the thing I mean if you worry about Magic becoming saturated I mean look yeah, at comedy, look at comedy yeah. <laughs> you sort of look in the, the programme you go 17 Magic shows this year okay, okay. and then you look at the comedy bit and you go oh there's a 197 comedy shows just in A. <laughs> in, you, Indeed, yeah. yeah. Um, so the, yeah, I think it's. I think when it's done right, it's it's not a bad thing at all. It's great. You see good magic, you go see more good magic. It's, yeah. The, the problem, problem is with bad magic, magic is, is so it's so bad. easy to go put a show on in Edinburgh, although it's expensive, and it's so easy to. I think you know. I look at my first show. You go look at it and go. Oh God, I did that. Is it a cringe? It is a cringe. I look at it, there's still stuff I do now mm. in kind of regular sets, not in the sh- current show, but that started off life there. And I think, but you've got to do that because you've got to go and get that stage time and get mm. better. Um, I think an audience, when they see you and you're 21 and you're doing your first Edinburgh, they'll see you differently to when you're older and you're doing your fifth Edinburgh and you're doing a bigger room and stuff. And you're a different person to an extent. Exactly. You've got different experiences. Yeah. You probably wouldn't be doing a narrative. No, not I wouldn't have done narrative. I wouldn't uh, even two years ago. Mm, I think it was. Yeah, yeah, you develop it, and an audience hopefully comes with you. And I think, no matter how old you are, I think even in that first show, I put in the effort. I wrote it. I scripted it. I rehearsed it. I got a director because I came from a theatrical background. Yeah. So where if you just turn up and go, hey, I'm going to do some tricks, you kind of go oh, just. 
It's it's a tough one because it's hard. Bad magic is hard to watch. Well, I think it's something that magic's got that comedy can learn from mm. quite a bit is the emphasis on theatrical yeah. abilities. Magic you know. is probably at its best when it's theatrical. Exactly, and you have to give thought to the direction of yeah. it. And probably the best thing to do is to get a director. Yeah. Director is is vital. I think you kind of and outside eyes looking at it and mm. you know, magic more so than stand up is you can't you have to direct it you have to choreograph it partly to hide anything you want to hide mm-hmm. but also for it particularly for me it's to feel like a show yeah. and I think some comedians do that really well and some comedians don't but equally some comedians don't need that I think if you look at when Brendan Burns won the um, the Edinburgh Comedy Award mm-hmm. that was an obviously directed piece. show it's a great bit of stand up but also he's really thought about Staging and how it's all going to play out, mm. and I think um, I just think I want to give my audience much more than just a mind reading show. Y- you want to give them the best, I yeah, mean... and I want them to go away having not expected it to be like that. It's like mm. we said, like you, know, you said earlier, you and the way I found to do that was go right narrative story. Let's give them a proper piece of theatre. There's a set which you never get in Edinburgh. You see, yeah. like, like I've got <laughs> stuff that I travel with. There's a set. There's a lighting design. There's so you had a full lighting design thing yeah. as well. Yeah, which is still used. So like even in, I've just come back from New Zealand, we took 100 kilos worth of stuff out with us. Oh, really? So uh, It's got extra things there, redid it also. You took it on a container or something? I had to, uh, because I got back last week and my show's in three days time, <laughs> I had to fly it. Oh, my goodness. Very expensive. Yeah. Um, <laughs> like the bigger stuff we get out there, but it's still, I think you, I kind of, I want it, I didn't want to, do it a half assed version mm, of it and you're too wanna, proud of it. You don't want to compromise yourself. No. Yeah. And I think although it's it's only a small tiny thing having a bit of set around you, but it makes such a difference to audience's perception. You come in, you see stuff, you go, Oh, we thought about this. Yeah. And it just yeah, it just feels right for the show. Do you worry about where you're gonna go next though? Because you've done the big sort yeah. of honesty it's, thing, it's sort of how do you take it up to the next level? It's always the question. Now it's the big question because I'm trying to start to think about what I'm going to do next year. Mm-hmm. And I've got some so, trick ideas. So, so you're coming to this Edinburgh? So this year I'm having a year off oh, from Edinburgh. Because okay. I decided I could go up and do a half assed version of a show, which would be all right. And sort of do tricks that I may have done before, rework. But but you haven't put the thought yeah, into Yeah, having taken that a time on the last show, I want to... I don't want to take a step back, I want to get better. So now I'm thinking, right, is there a new narrative I can do? Is there a new story? Is that done? I've got some ideas for tricks, so they all sort of feed into it. And also, like tricks, I want to do stuff no one, particularly this show, every trick bar one was all my own. Mm-hmm. And that one was a real tight reworking of something else a friend of mine had uh, created and let me use for it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I want to continue doing that. I want to. Because I don't want people to come and see my tricks and then go see another show and see the exact same trick, and particularly with my reading. You kind of, there's six tricks which every mind reader does. Yeah. And in a in like stand up set or a bit of cabaret or something, that's great because mm. they're the classics. But in an Edinburgh show, as soon as you see someone do the same sort of thing or use the same props, an audience go, oh, I've seen that. It's strange, yeah. isn't it? Because with magic, actually, it's kind of accepted that you use other people's tricks. Yeah, because you can buy tricks. Because yeah, you, you buy them. That's what magicians do. You buy tricks, you buy books, you buy DVDs, and you do it. Whereas when you're on the circuit and you're with comedians and yeah. you're doing their own jokes, you need to be doing your own tricks, exactly. I guess. Yeah. I think you get a point where, I know last year, two acts were using the same prop. And you sort of just go, that's what I want to avoid. Mm. And it's fine, because both of them are doing very different things with it, and it was both tricks were great but I don't want an audience to feel like they've seen it before mm. particularly with Darren and Handy having done everything <laughs> you sort of you constantly go right how can I make this me how can I make it different what can I do which I haven't done before and this show's full of stuff no one will have seen before and the next show hopefully will be I've got some ideas brewing of effects and possible methods so I go right what can I create which but, no one's seen but it is that much more difficult isn't it yeah. as a you know because as a comedian you can do jokes about anything really yeah and you um, can find a fresh approach a bit easier than yeah. I think it's uh, I think it was Teller who came up with this analogy of going what people don't realise about magicians compared to say a stand up comedian is um, or say like a guitarist or you go right if you were a guitarist you play the guitar the magician has to first invent the concept of a guitar 
then has to build the guitar, or design and build the guitar, then has to learn how to play the guitar, then has to learn to play the guitar so the audience can't see that he's playing the guitar, <laughs> then has to write a script, and then has to write the jokes. <laughs> it's, it's a brilliant yeah, analogy. Yeah. There's all these extra levels to it, and I think um, you need to spend the time to do that. I think you can go and churn out shows and shows and shows, but Let's actually taking that special. effort to... yeah. Certainly, that's why I feel Fatal Destruction is... The worry is always, well, oh, that's the best thing I'll ever do. Because <laughs> it's so... I'm so proud of it. I can, oh, don't know if I'm going to be able to top this one. Well, best of luck with Thank you. everything. It's been a pleasure. Likewise. And, uh, yeah, much. no, we hope to see you soon. Yeah. So, you can see Chris on the 29th of... May. The 29th of... You say it. You can see me, uh, Chris Cott, <laughs> in Fatal Destruction on the 29th of May or the 19th of June at the Other Belly on the South Bank. That. There you go. Slick. Slick. So you're a professional. I can you, promote the hell out of my shows. <laughs>